Welcome to The Monk and the Hedonist, a podcast that explores longevity and resilience and all the drivers that influence it, from our cognitive to physical to emotional health. The show was hosted by Dr. Bobby Canero and Dr. Deepthi Agarwal. Tune in as we speak to experts, peak performers, and influencers on these important topics. Welcome to tonight's episode of The Monk and the Hedonist. And we have a really special guest tonight, Dr. Forrest Tennant, who will be talking to us about neuroinflammatory disorders of the spine. And, you know, there's a very personal reason as to why I wanted Dr. Forrest Tennant on, which I'll be going into. But before we dive in, I would like to first make a toast in our usual monk and hedonist fashion. Deepthi, tonight I am drinking an iced chamomile tea. What are you drinking over there in Chicago? Bobby, tonight I am having some kava stress relief tea. I think I've had this before in a prior episode, but it's just a nice uh, tea to have down as I'm winding down the evening. Cheers. Cheers. Dr. Dr. Tennant. I am drinking a diet zero sugar 7-Up. Okay. (laughs) Perfect. Perfect. Well, we thank you for coming on tonight's show. You know, tonight we are going to be talking about neuroinflammatory diseases of the spine with a special emphasis on arachnoiditis. And, you know, I have a very personal reason for bringing you on. You know, my father, who is a retired anesthesiologist now, was going through a routine epidural injection for lower back pain, and he ended up developing arachnoiditis. And him, as an anesthesiologist, And myself, as an oncologist, really had very minimal understanding about what this was outside of just reading about it in the textbooks. And once he got the diagnosis through MRI and also uh, the clinical symptoms that, the classic clinical symptoms that come up from this, we started really diving deep into the treatment for it, which there was a really big lack of information out there. But your name came up. And really, you you know, you have been a pioneer and a leader in this space. And what blew me away was the, the number of people out there that have developed this type of neuroinflammatory disorder that are just sitting out there without a lot of guidance and help. I scoured the Facebook groups out there, and there's thousands literally thousands of patients out there who have got this. And it's much, much more common than I've ever known. So thank you. And maybe we can start by just talking about your background and what got you into the space. Well, first off, I'm I'm fundamentally a uh, an internist by trade. Took my uh, public health fellowship uh, actually in psychiatry. And uh, my early interests uh, primarily were in addiction, but soon uh, pain came uh, as a follow-up. So without going into a lot of detail, uh, that's really uh, where I came from. Out of addiction medicine, I was one of the early people who started off developing urine testing and methadone clinics and naltrexone and trying to uh, deal with those unfortunate individuals. And I actually got into pain management because, you know, I think some people today are still confused, but back in the 70s when I got involved, Everybody, we thought anybody who was taking an opioid drug was obviously an addict, but we soon learned that some of those people take take opioids for legitimate pain purposes, not for euphoria or not for some psychological reason. And so uh, I initially early on, and when I say early on, I'm talking about 40 years ago, realized that we have to treat addicts over here and we've got to treat legitimate pain patients over here. And very, And we have a few people that are kind of a mixture of the two. But most people are pretty clear cut. So I have spent uh, 50 years uh, studying these people and staying with it. Uh, how I got involved with arachnoiditis is, is a bit of history. Most people today don't realize what Panopec was. Now, arachnoiditis has an interesting history to start with. Arachnoiditis, and first off, it's not a spider bite. That used to be what everybody thought. The arachnoid layer is part of the spinal canal covering or part of the brain covering. And I'll just use the word covering because words like meninges and thecal sac or that's for us doctors. But everybody else calls it a spinal canal covering. 
And so it's really part of the covering. And there are cases that go back into the probably 1700s. I found one physician uh, who probably treated cases in the 1700s. But in the 1800s, it's very interesting. It was a frightening disease. The normal causes of it were syphilis and tuberculosis. Some of the physicians will recognize who Addison was, Dr. Addison. If you go back and look at his dozen or so cases that he published in 1855, about a third of those were arachnoiditis cases who developed adrenal failure. And of course they died. Arachnoiditis was actually defined in medical dictionaries in around 1860. And so it's been around a long time. During the 1900s, what caused arachnoiditis fundamentally disappeared. Syphilis was treated, tuberculosis was treated, so it was a, a dead disease, gone. And then they introduced pantopec for myelograms, and that dye was toxic to some people. And so during the 1980s, I was actually referred people who had, and they already had the diagnosis of arachnoiditis due to the pantopec dye. And gosh, they were terrible cases. And I even had our first self-help group out of St. Louis. And those people uh, pretty well disappeared because in 1987, MRIs were developed. And that was a godsend because MRI technology has been wonderful. I mean, the, the te that technology is really why I'm doing this tonight. If contrast technology MRIs had not come along we really could not have characterized this disease. We would not, and we would never have figured out that protruding discs are inflamed, the cauda equina can get inflamed, the covering can get inflamed, uh, adhesive arachnoiditis is the worst thing you can have because it's really a matter of spinal cord roots, known as the cauda equina, getting inflamed, and the covering getting inflamed, and the two hooked together in a mass. And so that's, a, that's the terrible disease. But because of contrast MRIs and that technology, people who have typical symptoms can be diagnosed. So really what is bringing us forward is really the MRIs. That's really what, what has made the difference. And when I started looking at them, I was totally confused. Couldn't make heads or tails out of looking at all those you know, nerve roots because radiologists don't look at nerve roots. They look at something that's surgical or as they should. But uh, I've learned to look at those nerve roots and a few other things. And so bottom line is we're now diagnosing people that we never even thought had a problem. And we've given a name such as fatal back syndrome or degenerative back or neuropathic back. I've got a lot of names that we probably should have never used. <laughs> but anyway, we now know that inflammation is in that spinal canal and so it's kind of an exciting uh, new thing, and it's making medical practice a lot more fun, in my opinion. So, so really, because of MRI, we're catching a lot more neuroinflammatory disorders of the spine and making the diagnosis of the, this whole spectrum of neuroinflammation, the worst of which is arachnoiditis. Is that, is that correct? That, that summarizes it very well. Uh, and it's, uh, when you're a physician or even a radiologist and you start looking for these things, you're quite confused. But I can tell you that it's like anything else. After you see a few and get the basics down, just like reading a chest X-ray, you, you can learn it and easy. And, and, they, and they should. And in fact, it's kind of fun. But you can see these different spinal inflammatory disorders on the new contrast MRIs. And so, uh, like I say, it's it's bringing, uh, I predict that uh, we're going to go forward with it. Now that we can diagnose this, we can get some better treatments. Dr. Tennant, thank you for sharing that with us. I'm actually quite fascinated as a pain physician. You know, this we're always looking at failed back surgery and neurodegenerative uh, disc disease. But arachnoiditis is not something we routinely look for unless there's a reason for us to think about it, which we'll get into in a second. The etiology of it has expanded, it looks like, over the last several years. But just to clarify, so this is not something that radiologists routinely look for. 
Well, they are now. I can tell you that when I started looking at MRIs five or six years ago, you never saw a radiology report with this diagnosis. Today, you see it routinely. And in fact, uh, sometimes uh, radiologists will call it, yes, it's there, and I don't, and vice versa. Because you can get into where you're not really quite sure whether you're just looking at inflammation in the cauda equina or are you not. And so there's, but nevertheless, it's still an inflammation. And so uh, I, I hope, and, uh, and I know it'll happen, because first off, it makes practice a little more fun. You can look at those MRIs and, uh, you know, in between patients or on the run. It's no big deal, really. Uh, it's really quite simple. And this way, we don't just have to sit there and say it's a failed back or it's a neuro neuropathic pain. We can put a little more uh, substance to it. Absolutely. That makes it easier and, and better treatment. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, I could teach a fifth grader how to read those MRIs. Or, you know, and They're not that tough, but it's new. It's like anything else. If you've never done it, it's like driving a car. It gets hard if you've never done it. But these MRIs are easy to read once you get the hang of it. Of course, for the audience, maybe we can start. Maybe we can go into the causes of neuroinflammation and arachnoiditis. There's a lot of people in the audience who, who are learning about this now for the first time, and they may be thinking, "Well, this is something that's pretty rare, and you know, I'm I'm not having spine surgery or an epidural, so I'm probably not at risk." But it actually ends up being a lot. Bigger than that, a lot more things can cause neuroinflammation than those invasive procedures. Yeah. First off, I think it's changing now. But over the recent years, a lot of the patients that got it after surgery or after epidural, so they always blamed the epidural or the surgery. But that really wasn't the case. Why did they have the surgery and epidural in the first place? And today, the main cause of adhesive arachnoiditis, and it's a cascade, Almost all these people start off with multiple protruding discs. So it's really disc disease. And the second most common cause we see today are those people who have genetic connective tissue or collagen disorders, of which the most common name is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So those two things appear to be the two main causes. Now, we still see a handful of people who have trauma, They've been in an auto accident. Uh, we also see a few people that we think were viral, but they're quite rare. We also see a handful of autoimmune diseases. And interestingly enough, something like psoriatic arthritis uh, seems to be associated with these things. But basically, we're looking at a degenerative spine issue in which people have protruding discs. And the research on this is fascinating. And I don't know why we didn't put two and two together some years ago, but those protruding discs have now been shown distinctively to have inflammation themselves. And so the protruding disc has inflammation. Now, we don't know whether inflammation starts and causes the protrusions or whether the protrusions develop the inflammation. But once you get inflammation under that disc, that disc is pushing on the arachnoid dural covering. And that inflammation can spread just like cellulitis on the face. It's just like MRSA. So it'll start spreading, and it can go from those discs to, you know, inflame the, the covering and then maybe pick up some nerve roots. Epidural fibrosis is an old diagnosis. In other words, the inflammation may go up into the epidural space. And if it gets there long enough in the cauda equina, that's when you can develop the adhesive arachnoiditis. It is my firm goal to let people know, and I'm letting myself know, that you try to get these people at the disc level or at the cauda equina level rather than waiting till you get adhesive arachnoiditis, because that's a horrible disease. And and it's just it's uh, the suffering and early death and everything is just terrible. All that we're getting, we're making some headway, but I think that what's new and what's a little shocking is that we have these common degenerative spine problems now, and there's a lot of reasons for it, and we're not sure why. We see people all the time that have protruding discs, but we really don't know why. Yeah, we know about sedentary lifestyles. We know about obesity. We know about no exercise. We know about lousy diets. 
But we've got literally thousands of people out there that all of a sudden are coming and presenting with these discs that are protruding, and we really don't know why. And one other thing that I want to say right out front that there's a big misunderstanding about. The, the medical profession, including those of us in pain management and surgery, yeah, there's a lot of talk about unnecessary surgery, unnecessary epidurals. But on the other hand, what they want us to do, <laughs> you know, we had to do something. And I know this is not a pleasant statement to make among a lot of the advocates, but epidural corticosteroid injections into the epidural space have probably prevented more arachnoiditis than it has caused. Now, that's one of the potential risks, but that doesn't mean you shy away from it. Okay, that I, I like to make that point out there because corticosteroids are an absolute essential compound for these spinal inflammatory conditions. And the reason is, is another thing that most physicians have no clue about. And that is to treat these problems, you've got to take agents that get across the blood brain barrier and get into the spinal fluid. And that menu is pretty short. We don't have a lot of drugs that do that. And so uh, I hear a lot of complaints about medical care, but when I get into it, I don't see negligence, and I know I've appeared in a few malpractice cases, and the doctors, they weren't to blame. They did what was indicated. And so uh, so we're, we're working those problems are getting worked up. You bring up a really important point. You know, when, when my father was initially diagnosed, you know, there were several doctors that he saw that just told him to take opioids and go home. And I think that there is a, a disconnect uh, when people hear the word, you know, inflammation of the spine and really neuroinflammation is very different. The management of neuroinflammation is very different than just your typical inflammation. And I think that's the key. And you have identified, you know, a protocol involving several different medications to effectively manage that. So maybe we can start going into that. I'd love to. Yeah. Because and for physicians, let me just uh, throw out one thing that, that was kind of a clue to this. Most physicians recall that years ago, they brought Toradol onto the market, and its primary use was by emergency rooms or doctors who would treat acute pain flares in their office. And Toradol worked very well. But you know, nobody bothered to ask the question why. Now, after, now we know why. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it gets into the spinal fluid in high concentrations. So it's a wonderful drug to calm down spinal fluid inflammation, or inflammation inside the spinal canal is more, more technically more correct. Unfortunately, that's a, it's a compound that you can't take every day because it's toxic, but it's very potent. Interestingly, there's about 13 commercial corticosteroids on the market. But you know, only about two of them cross the blood-brain barrier and get into spinal fluid in very high concentrations. And that's dexamethasone, which is being used for COVID now a lot. And the other one is methylprednisolone. And those have also been ones that have worked well for us in the epidural injections. Prednisone occasionally will work pretty well, but the others hardly do much. So uh, you have to, uh, what I'm getting at is that these drugs that get into spinal fluid and really work on something like arachnoiditis really have to be administered by a physician who understands what they're doing and understands the dosages. And the patient has to be aware of the risks and know what they're, what they're doing relative to a risk-benefit ratio. But on the other hand, if you don't do something with those, it really is unfortunate. Let me say one other thing, though, that is the greatest thing that's come out of this. Some of the old herbal anti-inflammatory agents work very well. I mean, the old-fashioned turmeric and curcumin ought to be taken by everybody, <laughs> okay? It, it's a wonderful anti-neuroinflammatory drug. And, and some of the old drugs like Boswellia and some of the homeopathic agents, there's one called serapeptase, uh, andrographis. But these are all herbs that, for some reason or another, they will cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the spinal fluid better than a lot of the prescription drugs. Of all the anti-inflammatory drugs on the commercial market, only three have found uh, much use. Uh, one is uh, the old drug, endomethacin. 
Somehow or another, it likes to get in the spinal fluid. And diclofenac, one of the new ones, that does too. Although a lot of patients are reporting meloxicam, we seem to be hoping. But those are about the only standard anti-inflammatory agents that do much. They, you know, the standard Motrin's and Apersons and stuff, don't. they just don't get enough into the spinal fluid to, to help neuroinflammation. So that's, uh, our menu isn't long, but, uh, but we've got enough that people can start getting some help. Let me say one last thing about the other drug that really needs to be talked about, and that's naltrexone. You know, it's being used by for a lot of things, but you know, we don't really quite understand how this thing works. Now, I was one of the original investigators in using naltrexone for heroin addiction, and then later for obesity and for alcoholism. It's got a lot of multiple effects, and I consider it to be one of the first-line treatments for arachnoiditis. And if in a new case, you certainly want to try an naltrexone and some low-dose Toradol and methylprednisolone or something like that before you go to opioids, for God's sakes. So that's what you, you try to do. You start out with the safer, easier things, and unfortunately, those people that are tragic are going to have to go to opioids and intrathecal pumps and implanted stimulators, so we're going to have some of that too. But initially, in new cases, you want to go with the safer, easier things that seem to work. Dr. Tennant, I love this multimodal analgesic plan that you've come up for the arachnoiditis. So a few things, you know, Bobby and I are big proponents of turmeric to use as an anti-inflammatory, both in our own lives, and I recommend it to every single patient. But you brought up an interesting point that I actually didn't know, and that it also crosses the blood-brain barrier. The turmeric? Yes. Okay. So that's that's another great drug to add to the armamentarium. Now, I was reading your handout earlier. You also mentioned something about deer antler. How does that uh, work into this treatment regimen? I'm so glad you asked. Two years ago, I'd never heard of deer antler velvet, and I thought it was a joke. <laughs> when they told me that somebody took this as a medicine, I said, you've got to be kidding. Anyway... There are two compounds out there that that are interesting. One is colostrum, and the other is deer antler velvet. Now, what colostrum is, and most people are more familiar with that, that's, of course, secreted by women or animals in, in a few hours after birth. But what colostrum has in it is all kinds of hormones, human growth hormone, chorionic gonadotrophin, insulin growth factor, epidermal growth factor. In other words, if you lay out all the hormones and colostrum, and the same thing is the case with deer antler velvet, you've got all of these hormones that are pro-growth hormones. They're cheap, they're simple, they're safe. It gets awfully tough and awfully expensive to try to give somebody growth hormone on human chorionic gonadotrophin. But now deer antler velvet, and let me see if I can explain this. Deer ant, there are apparently some deers, and most of them are, grow, are in Australia and New Zealand. They're called red deers, and their antlers have inside them this velvety substance that is essentially their pituitary, and it can be taken out. And I guess thousands of years ago, deer antler velvet was known as the king and queen's medicine because it was only available for the hierarchy of society. And so it's been around for thousands of years. And it's been brought back by companies who do this. So if you don't quite know what to do for these people, you you can't hurt anybody by telling them to take these simple, inexpensive hormonal products. I like them to try that before you you go to the chorionic gonadotrophin or the testosterone or estradiols. So I like those nice, inexpensive things that that have a lot of hormones in them. Do they really work, and would they hold up in a double-blind study? I'm not sure, but nevertheless, uh, I like the theory. (laughs) So the theory is pretty good. Okay, great. That's really good knowledge for us to know. Yes. So, uh, Forrest, you know, I I read your your handbook. And for, you know, for patients who have been diagnosed with adhesive arachnoiditis or you're a family member that has it, I strongly recommend that you download Dr. Tennant's handbook. You can get that online. If you do a Google search, it comes up very easily. And it was from the Tenant Foundation. 
It's very, very useful. And one of the best parts about this handbook is, is that it really simplifies something that's very, very complicated. And one of the things you say in there, um, Forrest, is that the best way to treat this and have the best outcome is to catch this early and to start treating it early. And, you know, you, um, you mentioned that there's kind of, you know, there's a multi-pronged approach to treat this. And you talked a little bit about the anti-inflammatory agents already, such as naltrexone, methylprednisone, dexamethasone. You also talked about the non-prescription anti-inflammatories like curcumin. The next one is the neuroregenerative agents. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, that's where the hormones come in. I really believe in what I call an anabolic neuroregenerative program, and not just the drugs, but these people, uh, they, need, they need a diet that's kind of high, that's got protein in it, a diet that's got some anti-inflammatory vegetables in it. Some of the uh, vitamins are uh, regenerative. Vitamin C is, B12 is, magnesium 3 and 8. So I believe in these, these things, neuroregeneration. The, uh, I haven't got into it too much, but I am a believer that if you're going to try to recover from some of these problems, you're going to have to probably take one of the things related to or one of the compounds called neurosteroids. Now, here's another new concept. The spinal cord and the brain itself makes about four or five compounds, hormones, if you will, they're now called neurosteroids, and the good Lord has put them there for the sole purpose of healing neuro tissue. Okay, now I'm going to rattle these off. One's pregnenolone, one is allopregnenolone, one is progesterone, one is estradiol, and DHEA, that's dihydroepiandosterone. It probably converts to testosterone. I don't know that the spinal cord makes their own testosterone, but certainly the estradiol probably and uh, DHE convert to testosterone. Bottom line is, these right now, I'm, that's part of my research. I know we need to be using these things, but I don't quite have firm recommendations. I hope to come back in six months or a year and give you some hardcore recommendations. I'll give you a couple of simple things. You know, I've been around medicine long enough to know that years ago, practically every woman who reached menopause took a shot of estradiol at her doctor's office once a month or twice a month. And, you know, I think we saw less pain and maybe there was something to this. Mm -hmm. Certainly the rheumatologists who treat lupus have found that a DHEA at a dosage of 200 milligrams a day is very therapeutic. A lot of rheumatologists put every lupus patient on DHEA 200 milligrams. And there's a pretty good reason for that because DHEA converts to estradiol and to testosterone and maybe a couple of other hormones that heal inside the spinal column. We are doing something else in research, and I'll, I'll go ahead and bring it up, because if they do develop adhesive arachnoiditis and the pain is so terrible, they're disabled, uh, even when you put a pump in them, you know, an opioid pump or an intrathecal stimulator, they still may not do it. And we are finding that there are two hormones that I'm going to bring up, and doctors uh, resist them. And I don't blame them because it, uh, it takes time, takes study. One is human chorionic gonadotrophin, that's HCG. And the other, here's another dirty word, anabolic steroids. Nandrolone and oxandrolone. Now, let me just say a couple of things about these two hormones. Human chorionic gonadotrophin, of course, is what goes way up when a woman is pregnant. That's a pregnancy test. Now, why does it go up? Human chorionic gonadotrophin has two wings to it, two amino acid chains. One contains the identical com hormones a luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, and thyroid hormone. Believe it or not, all those pro-hormones are one wing of HCG. The other's wing is the hormone that a pregnant woman uses to grow the embryo, brain, nervous system, and skin. And so those 
Adhesive arachnoiditis patients that have found cure or almost cure have almost all taken HCG. Now, HCG is controversial. It's been abused, used for weight, used for sports, and now it's pretty expensive. You've got to get it under the trade name Pregnil, but nevertheless, it makes some sense. Now, antibiotic steroids grow tissue. Now, again, that's, it's been a bad word because they were abused in sports. And so the word antibiotic steroid, everybody thinks that the woman's going to start growing beards and the man's going to get testicular cancer and they're scared to death of antibiotic steroids. The FDA label for antibiotic steroids is wasting disease, catabolic deterioration. Well, these, that's what these people are. The time you get adhesive arachnoiditis, you've moved into a catabolic state. You're slowly dying. Your tissues are going. That disease just takes you over. Now, we're using nandrolone, and that's the FDA indication is for this kind of a disease, but it's hardly ever been used. We're getting some, you know, we haven't done any blind studies, but we're certainly getting good open reports on, on the use of that. I know one physician who's got about 30 adhesive arachnoiditis patients. He's got them all on nandrolone, 25 milligrams twice a day. I've gone in and interviewed some of those patients, and they're doing beautifully. I'm a little shocked, in fact, on how well they're doing. And that any compounding pharmacy can make it, and it's relatively inexpensive. The bottom line is, I'm not... I don't want to be missionary about these things, but I do want to call people's attention to this is bringing a dimension to medical practice that's new, it's different, it's a little frightening. You wonder, can this be true? But we've got diseases that we don't have anything else for, and so it is new, and I think that a lot of doctors are just going to have to put their toe in the water and give it a go. So, you know, outside of the outside of managing inflammation which we talked about, you know, the other step is to get medication that augments neuroregeneration, which is what we, what we just talked about as well. The other thing that happens, as you mentioned, is that, uh, you know, the CSF fluid can actually get blocked. There can be a blockage, uh, when you get arachnoiditis. Well, you know, what do you recommend to help with that? I'm so glad you asked. I have come up with another New, a new, the new term that nobody's yelled at me yet. So, and I call it spinal fluid flow exercises. Because if you, what really happens in that bottom part of the spinal canal is when you get adhesive arachnoiditis, it's really a tumor. It's a mass of nerve roots and covering together. And I must, I confess, I never bothered to find out up until a couple of years ago when I started studying, I did not realize that the spinal fluid turns over about four times a day. All of us humans make new spinal fluid about every four to six hours. Now, that must mean that it's pretty valuable. And blood doesn't turn over except every three or four months. Same with lymph. But spinal fluid is turned over every few hours. So it has physiologic purposes of cleansing, uh, lubrication, carrying out inflammation that we don't even understand. It's rarely been studied, but we do know one thing. When you get that mass of nerve roots down in that spinal canal, it's like putting a, you know, logs or a dam in a creek. It's going to back up the fluid or disturb it. And incidentally, there have been some medical engineers who've studied this, of all things, and have actually shown that the flow gradient is changed with arachnoiditis. Now, why anybody bothered to do this study, I don't know, but I'm glad they did. So what do you do about it? Well, I'm a great believer in, in exercises, and there's simple stuff. Uh, for example, I, I'm a great believer in either walking on a trampoline or swinging at a swing or rocking in a rocking chair. One vignette that nobody ever understood, but you, you may or may not know who Dr. Janet Travell was, but Dr. Janet Travell was a physiatrist, pm and and her father was one also, but she was the physician who took over John F. Kennedy's care when he was ready to commit suicide and go on. He had failed all the surgeries, couldn't walk, was going to give up his Senate seat. And she took him, and one of the first things she did was make him rock in a rocking chair about four times a day. And she even brought a rocking chair into the White House, into the Oval Office, and said, you're going to rock several times a day. 
Well, I now understand. I don't know whether she knew how it worked, but it increases apparently rocking motions. And all these people that I used to see walking around my condominium compact swinging their arms, they knew what they were talking of doing. So swinging your arms when you walk, arm swings, they've been done for centuries. And apparently that gets you some, some spinal fluid moving. The important thing to know about spinal fluid is this. There is no pump. The spinal fluid is made in the brain. It actually goes down, has to turn around and come back up. And so it actually flows against gravity part of the time. Now, how does it do that? Well, there's debate over what does it. But some of these old-fashioned remedies apparently do have, have some merit. So I'm a great believer in people walking on a trampoline, uh, deep breathing, uh, arm swinging, rocking on a swing or in a rocking chair. Uh, these are simple things. Uh, I also think everybody has got to do some stretching. One other thing about adhesive arachnoiditis, which is just awful, it is really misnamed. Uh, it really should be called dural arachnoiditis. And there are some old pathologists from the 20 who called it that. They recognized that it wasn't just the arachnoid layer. It was also the dural layer. And so the spinal fluid would seep through it into the epidural space and then on out into the tissues. And those people will, they're the ones that will have, if you ever see somebody with a terrible back pain and maybe having some leakage or seepage into the uh, fluid into the tissues, and that spinal fluid is toxic. It's not supposed to get out. And so they, they get a lot of problems. Exercise-wise, incidentally, I'm a great believer in several other things. Uh, water baths, I'm like, I like the old-fashioned magnets and copper. I still think those old remedies do some good. And I, I think people ought to, ought to try those. There, you get people who like the magnets, they rub magnets over their spine. You get people who like to put on a mag, you know, a little, a brace with magnets in it or sleep on a, you know, a mattress with some magnets in it. These are inexpensive old remedies that ought to be tried. The people that were around a thousand years ago weren't as dumb as we thought. They came up with some things that still work. And so I'm I, I like that. And of course, uh, today, one of the things that's come along uh, has been uh, the use of uh, electromagnetic therapies, and I'm a great believer in those. Pulsed electromagnetic energy is really something that I'd love to see everybody be able to get one of the new instruments. So I like those too. So a lot of new things are out there. Bottom line, on any given patient, I can't tell you exactly what's going to work. You just have to build a tailor-made program. It's still a rare disease. We don't have any controlled studies. Nobody's going to put up the money to do them at this point. But I predict that one of these days we'll have biologics for AA. We'll have some really good stuff. But right now, it's, you, just, you try everything you can. So when we're talking about neuroinflammation, there's a spectrum, as we mentioned, with adhesive arachnoiditis kind of being at the edge of that spectrum, being the most severe. But even amongst adhesive arachnoiditis, there's a spectrum within that where you have cases that are somewhat milder versus cases that are severe, maybe depending on when you caught it and how severe it was at the time of diagnosis. Would you agree with that? I mean, have you a seen... Absolutely. Yeah. Just like most diseases, I categorize them mild, moderate, severe, and catastrophic. And we do have a lot of people out there in society who have had no treatment. They're, they've gotten into the severe or catastrophic categories. These people uh, have, have got so much scarring, so much damaged tissue that our inflammatory agents and exercise aren't going to do a lot of good. And those people are going to require hardcore pain management. And so I don't want anybody out there to think that we're we're done with intrathecal pumps uh, for opioid administration or when we're not done with uh, intrathecal uh, electrical stimulators. We need those things and still a lot of these people. And so I we need we need everything we've got out there for these cases. You want to try to catch them at the mild and moderate categories, obviously, because I do think we are seeing a lot fewer people. That uh, five, six years ago, when I started reading MRIs, they were just awful looking. I mean, just terrible scars, and you wondered how they could even walk. And a lot of them didn't. Today, frankly, I don't see quite that. 
that. So I, maybe I'm just uh, optimistic and Pollyannish, but I think we're seeing uh, these people get better. Now, they may be getting treatment with just something like gabapentin or Motrin for all I know, but they're getting something. I don't think these people are being ignored in medical practice anymore. They're getting some treatment. And the social media groups, uh, they're spreading everything every day out there, and that's been a big help. Like I say, everybody can go down to the vitamin shop and get some curcumin. Uh, you know, everybody can get something. And I think they're doing it. So uh, that's been great to see. In in the mild to moderate groups, have you actually seen reversals and what we call cures, you know, where they're off of some of these pain, these medications? Yes. I would like to think it has a lot to do with my treatment, and every doctor does. I've got some patients that fundamentally are cured and are not taking opioids. They're hardly taking anything else. Some have taken some odd treatments. Some of, most of them have taken the HCG somewhere along the line. But we do have people now who literally look like they've pretty well reversed the condition. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the MRI, the nerve roots still may look like they're there. But So what I think may happen is some of those nerve roots may grow around the scar and give them back their normal function. So... Uh, I think the, main, the big thing about this is everybody should be given some hope. Uh, this is just not a hopeless disease. We can do something for everybody. We can get some relief and recovery for everybody. It may take some rather dramatic treatments and some treatments you don't like and some risk you don't want to take. But nevertheless, we can get something for everybody, regardless of what spe- where they are on the spectrum. Dr. Tennant, that's so important to emphasize that there's something for everyone, because I think, you know, especially for someone like me who works with a lot of chronic pain patients, you probably get the worst. To not have that hope can really cause a lot of mental anxiety, actually. And if anyone who has ever experienced chronic pain, I'm sure can appreciate that. One thing I wanted to ask you is you've come up with a nice cocktail, sort of a therapy for people to try with the arachnoiditis. Do you think some of those things are surmisable to patients that are suffering from intractable low back pain? Such a common issue that most of the population faces. Even something like the electromagnetic therapy, I was curious what you thought of that. The answer is yes. I think today, there, and there's so many back patients that I don't know how many doctors want to do this or can do it. But I think that probably everybody who's got chronic low back pain ought to probably have a simple uh, inflammatory panel, you know, a SED rate, a CRP, white count. If they can get it, an MRI, a contrast MRI certainly would be in order if if the finances are there. But the other thing that you can do, those people who get, I used to think it was just adhesive arachnoiditis, but I've now come to the conclusion that if they get inflammation in the cauda equina nerve roots, they're going to have some specific symptoms. And so I personally, if a person can't get an MRI or these things, you can at least get started on some treatment with them rather than just call it a chronic low back. You can at least maybe get them started. When they get inflammation in the cauda equina, even before it goes into AA, those people have some interesting symptoms. A lot of, almost all of them complain about burning feet. Okay, they're, they're burning somewhere. So the burning seems to be typical. Second thing is, which I used to be mystified about, they all complain about either water dripping on their legs or some kind of insect sensation on their legs. And the third thing they get is that they'll get some kind of bladder impairment. Now, that may be anything from hesitancy to dribbling to where they can't stop. But I didn't know this, but I looked this up. There are 21 nerve connections in the cauda equina to the bladder. And so, you know, it doesn't take much inflammation in the cauda equina to infect the bladder. So if they've got a little bladder problem, even though it's kind of minor, uh, some burning in the legs, uh, any kind of water or insect sensation, you can pretty well bet they've got inflammation inside the spinal canal, and you can certainly justify some simple uh, anti-inflammatory treatments to get them started. But again, 
Uh, it's expensive, time consuming, but today, uh, anybody who's got chronic back pain who needs medication every day, they don't make it at their chiropractor or at the physical therapist, and they're, they're in your office or mine. There, it would be nice to have MRIs on all of them. Right. The other thing I wanted to ask you was regarding the recommendation for the high protein diet and that serving as an anti-inflammatory. And, you know, we do a lot of podcasts here discussing things like diet and what's considered anti-inflammatory for the body. And so far, I don't think the high protein diet is going to win in that category, at least in, you know, the more recent literature. So what's your take on that? I'm just more curious both from a professional and personal standpoint. I'm delighted you ask. I mean, I, when I say high-protein diet, this is coming on a matter of practicality. I mean, gluten-free diets, Wahi's diet. I mean, I could give you a diet, and I'm sure that's what you're talking about. There's a whole lot better diet than just say take high-protein. But what I have found out from a practical point of view, sad to say, and I've taken a lot of dietary histories, and you find out that these people haven't eaten an egg, they haven't had a piece of chicken or a fish or anything in days. Sometimes they almost look like they have a pure sugar diet. So when I say a high-protein diet, I, what I really mean is, would you mind eating a piece of chicken or an egg or a piece of fish today, each day? So I really ought to call it eat a protein a day diet. Uh, it's not the, what you want. I, I think I know where you're coming from, and I agree with you. I just have found that from a practical point of view that people in America have a lousy diet. I just come on and call it like it is. I so, can't get people to follow good diets. <laughs> so point taken. So basically you're saying the further you can get away from the standard American diet, the better. And I think people do have poor nutritional uh, IQ. And so I, I see what you're saying. You're just trying to give people a well-balanced diet. Oh, well, it's, you know, everybody buys fast food, uh, particularly with the COVID virus. Everybody is driving through any, any number of fast food places. So the diet has probably gotten worse in, in the last year. And, and, you know, you've got to get some protein, you know, because all your neurotransmitters that involved with healing or come from an amino acid, whether it's dopamine or serotonin or endorphin, all those are protein based. And so yeah, I, I try to get him to eat some protein, but now that you brought it up, I haven't been very successful. So if you've got a better idea, to let me know about it. I have not, I, I got a sneaking suspicion that we, and let me say another thing too, and I hate to bring this up. Every time I send somebody to a nutritionist, they give them a nice complex diet that they don't follow. And so we need some kind of a simple diet that will get something done. I'm all ears. I've been a little discouraged on trying to teach people diets. I'll be honest about it. Yeah, I think it's it's very challenging, especially because um, the standard American diet, the way it's evolved, it, we have a lot of work to do now to overcome some of our longstanding thinking. So slow changes. We're hoping that people will get in, good information from this podcast. Yeah. I will say this. I got a letter yesterday on which somebody wrote me and said they were on the Wahi diet plus our protocol. They were clear off almost all medicines and were only pain some days. She was almost down to cure status. And she was really following a really strict low carbohydrate diet. And she's really doing it the right way. I'd like to clone her and have her teach everybody. But uh, so I think we've got a lot of work to do on diets, and it may pay off. Maybe we're not putting enough effort into it. Of course, one of the symptoms I've been hearing a lot when I go onto social media and, and, and look into some of these groups is that they find it hard to sleep. You know, with all of, with, with all of these protocols and regimens of medications that people with neuroinflammation take that really impacts their sleep, what kind of recommendations do you have to help with that? If they have constant pain, you know, they say that pain is there 24 or 7, you're probably going to, they're going to need some kind of medication probably. I mean, we'd love to be able to give everybody 10 or 20 milligrams of melatonin and a couple of valerian roots and or a couple of tryptophanes and hope they would sleep. But I, I'm afraid that we physicians are going to get to difficult cases and those people are going to need sleeping medication. 
And I'm always amazed at the panorama of ones that seem to work. You know, you've got a lot of patients these days taking old-fashioned amitriptyline or nortriptyline, uh, trazodone. Plus, they're taking the newer ones, the Ambien's and the Lunestas. The, the benzodiazepines are still out there. And so uh, I think that most of the, a lot of these people, by the time they get an easy arachnoiditis, are probably going to have to have medicated assisted sleep. And those are usually for patients who are maybe into the severe category, would you say? Yes. What about for those who are in the mild to moderate category? Again, I, uh, I'm i a fan of natural stuff if it'll work. You know, I mean, a doctor sleep at night if they know they're taking melatonin rather than Xanax. Okay, it's a, it's a simple trade-off. And, and so you, uh, I like to have people start off with sleeping medications with some of the natural compounds. I use a lot of valerian root if I, along with maybe some tryptophan or 5-HTP. So I'm a believer in the natural stuff if it'll work on the milder cases. But on the other hand, when they move on into that severe and catastrophic stage, I think it becomes a little inhumane not to give them something to help them sleep. Yeah, that makes total sense. You, it, from your experience, you know, when patients are taking, you know, drugs like naltrexone, you know, is there is there a time limit as to, you know, how long they can stay on this uh, without it causing other issues? Uh, or is naltrexone, in your opinion, pr- a pretty safe drug? At, at, in like, these doses? Looks pretty safe. But, you know, uh, every time we say that, you know, you know drugs are funny. Uh, they get down into the one-year and two-year longevity, and then you see the complications. I, I think that I get asked all the time, how long am I going to have to take these medications? Let me answer that. If a person gets to where that pain is gone and they're ambulating, I think they ought to maybe cut back. Uh, I hate to see them stop something like their curcumin or their antler vomit. Some of, again, some of your natural safe things as kind of an insurance policy. But if they get to where they can get that pain down, I don't see any reason why they should stay on the corticoids and a lot of these other medications. You want to try to take them on off. So that I, I don't I don't want to tell people that we think it's a lifetime for you. My my pitch to the patients is we're, we've seen too much progress in dealing with inflammation in the spinal canal that let's not talk in terms of this being a lifetime proposition. And let me tell you my my basis for saying this. I used to have to treat like I said, I'm an old internist. I remember the days with rheumatoid arthritis, we'd give them a shot of gold. You know, we used all these terrible old medicines for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Well, now we've got all these new biologics. So in some ways, the long-term trends of or, or patterns of rheumatoid arthritis and spinal canal inflammation are kind of the same. You know, they're going to go into remissions. They're going to go into relapses. But... I just don't think we want to tell people they've got to be on these things all their life, and we'll keep trying to get them into remission. And you can always restart a drug. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's kind of where I'm at on, on the things. I think people, we get them down, and we're getting more and more people like that. Now, for example, uh, people are coming forward. They, let's say they, one of the unfortunate women who looks like they're developing AA or a similar condition after epidurals for, for delivery or after surgery, or uh, even trauma, what have you. We're getting a lot of those people early now, and they're getting a pretty good result. I just would hate to see them try be to- either told or have to stay on all these medications for life. I think we want to try to tell people, no, they're, that's why we call it hope. We're going for cures, okay? <laughs> we're, we're, we, hope you, we hope we can make it. Of course, we, we want to be respectful of your time, because, you know, we can continue to talk about this complex disease for, for a long time. But to be respectful, you know, I just want to summarize really quickly what we talked about. These neuroinflammatory uh, diseases, uh, you know, they have a spectrum of severity, anything from just inflama- mild inflammation all the way to adhesive arachnoiditis. The best way to manage these is to catch them early. And once you catch them, there's a multi-pronged approach. Number one, you have to manage the, inflama- the neuroinflammation by taking neuroinflammatory agents such as steroids. We have to help facilitate CSF flow because that can get blocked. And then you talked about exercises and stretching and even a rocking chair that can be effective. 
You talked about neuroregeneration because some of those nerves can get damaged. And you mentioned the hormones, so certain hormones can help with that. And then we talked briefly about some of, you know, also being able to manage the pain effectively. We didn't really go into specific pain medications, but I know that, that there are several, such as gabapentin and also the opioids uh, when they get really severe. Is there anything I'm missing? Is there anything else you would like to talk about uh, before we get off? No, you pretty well covered it. As you say, the multi-prong approach is what uh, what they're going to need, and most of these things can be can be done. And I just would like to say this, and patients seem to respond to something that I've sort of telling them. I tell them you got to build your own program. And, I, and let me along that line, I do have one thing. One of my great pet peeves today: the American public, and I suppose this is true in other modern countries. Because of pharmaceutical and medical device advertising, have given people the erroneous belief that there's one drug for one disease, one procedure for one disease, and there's a magic bullet for everything. And right now, it's a, it may be stem cells or it may be something like that. And we have this burden today. It's really a burden. We have to tell people that, no, there is not a magic bullet you're going to have to approach these things by several different things. And you have to continually work to build a program for you. you got to tailor make your own program. And your doctor will work with you. Just let them know that you're willing to do that, but not looking for that magic bullet. So I think that some of this advertising on television were, I mean, to watch the television, you'd think there was one drug for everything from erectile dysfunction to diabetes to dementia. And that's just not true. And, and I hate to say it, you don't see many practicing doctors out there on the advertisements anymore. Uh, you know, we're kind of in the shadows along with the patients. Uh, but we've got to try to let them know that that's, uh, that's, that's the way it is. And that uh, we'll help you try to build your own program. And it's not going to happen fast. And it's not going to happen with any one way or any one treatment. You're going to have to put together a package or a program. And, and I do think that's my, my pet peeve. I think I spend more time talking about that or writing about that because they all have got this thing in their mind that we're holding back that one treatment that'll cure them. And it's just not, not the case. Yeah, you bring up a really good point, Dr. Tennant, because, you know, especially with certain syndromes like chronic pain syndromes, there is not a one size fits all. And we know that the direction of medicine needs to change into more personalized medicine because everyone's, you know, a little unique dealing with different issues, different stressors in their life, which may be compounding their issues. And so I do think it's very important for people to understand that it is a multi-pronged approach. I wanted to also thank you for elucidating, you know, the details of this pathology in more detail and potentially helping some people to identify what the next steps for them are. If I have two last questions, if someone was interested in finding you or getting a consultation from you, where can they reach you? They can contact our uh, foundation office. And if they really want to be seen, I've got doctors that take them and I'll consult with them on that. And, um, let me tell you another thing, though. I don't want to say I discourage people from calling me, but in some ways I do to some extent. And I'll tell you why. This problem is in every community in the world. And we're going to have to have physicians in every community learn about this disease and take these diseases. So uh, I'm of course, I enjoy it, and I love it when people, uh, I'm like any doctor, I love it when they see me and they give me accolades and tell me what a great job we're doing. But on the other hand, from Maine to Miami to Montrose, we need doctors and nurse practitioners, chiropractors. We need the medical field to understand. They've got to look at the spinal canal differently. These people are here. And you just can't pick up the phone and find that high-powered specialist across the country and put somebody on a plane to go there and see it. Again, that kind of gets into that one-way thing. And so I'm my goal of my foundation is, he might surprise you, is to bring a treatment of arachnoiditis to every community in the world. 
Wonderful. The uh, last thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, this is a longevity podcast and we're very big on self-care and you are a busy, very busy man, you know, doing all the research you do and the, the people that you help. What do you do for fun or what, what is your guilty pleasure? Well, in reality, medicine is really my hobby. I have another business that I run. I live in Wichita part of the time and Los Angeles part of the time. And I have a business that I love dearly in Kansas. And I'm in, I finance rural real estate. And then I have our foundations. But I also have a, a bunch of collections of, of antiques and stuff that I also deal with. And I have the world's largest collection of antique shoehorns. So anyway, <laughs> so I have, I have kind of some corny hobbies like everybody else. And so my wife and I enjoy, uh, enjoy those things. And Did we, you say uh, shoehorns? You have the world's largest shoehorns, collection of shoehorns. Right. Oh, wow. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever brings <laughs> so you into your flow state. That's wonderful. Yeah. So anyway, we, my wife and I, we, we take a lot of time off and do some traveling. So we're, don't feel sorry for us. We're, we we're not even, we don't even consider ourselves old. We're, we're going for a hundred. So <laughs> that's, that's perfect. That's what we love. Well, thank you, yeah. Dr. Tennant. We have taken enough of your time and we will cheers to you. And My pleasure. Thank, thank you for the good work. I sure thank appreciate you. what you're doing. Okay. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you for all that you've done. You know, for the community. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cheers. Right. Good luck. <laughs>